Thank you. Cool. Uh, I'm just going to go straight into it. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Denver Avery from
uh, unique identifier thing into sort of a tangible space. So it could be a file, a document, a key, um, anything like that. Dagger touches it, you get the alert. Um, but importantly, uh, I'll kind of reiterate and stress this: is that the, at the you know under the under the hood, it's just an HTTP request or a DNS lookup that's going to trigger these alerts. Okay, so when that um, you know when that request is made, it lands on the Canary Token server. You get an option of either sending an alert via email or web, or you can you can choose to just send both or you know use both of those um, alerting channels. You're going to want to deploy them everywhere. Um, so think of, it, well, first you can drop them sort of onto existing infrastructure or even embed them into to applications. Common use cases would be high value targets. So let's say CFO, CTO, CEO's dot the desktop, drop something on there, cloud environments, file shares, um, email, chat logs. So if we think of, uh, let's use a, a business email compromise as an example. Attacker gains access to the mailbox, starts thinking or searching for keywords like credentials, passwords, access, and that's kind of the procedure. It's going to be the same with your communication tool. So, someone's popped your Teams or Slack, um, you've gone in there, edited an old message in the chat, added those keywords in there, added the token. Someone touches a token, you know, your Teams is being compromised. So, sprinkle them all over. Um, another cool thing is it doesn't matter if um, if the token is executed on the endpoint where you place it, or if it's exfiltrated, it's still going to um, generate an alert. So, an example of a token that behaves that way would be the word canary token. So, we're dropping it on a, an executive's machine over here, and now the attacker compromises the endpoint, grabs the document, um, you know, exfiltrates, opens it up, you know, a week later, different geographical location, VPN, or just coffee shop, whatever, just somewhere else, right? Um, and we'll still get the, the alert. So you're going to see the, the alert contains a public IP address. You know, it's not, it might not really mean much to us, but we've configured this token reminder field that says CTO's desktop. And with all tokens, this is super important to configure this as descriptively as possible. With the alert saying, this thing that we placed on the CTO's desktop has been accessed. Let's start our investigation over there for malicious or suspicious activity. Okay, different types of tokens. Uh, if you head over to the site, you'll see a bunch of interesting different types of tokens. Uh, we'll be covering the web the DNS token, AWS, Word, and then we'll tinker with kubeconfig and the uh, wiregod token. Okay, so the first demo is up. Okay, uh, let me just lower this a bit. I think that looks cool. Okay, so we're going to start off by just um, creating this um, webbug and DNS token, and then we're going to go ahead and create some more exciting types. Um, so the reason we, we do the webbug and the DNS token first is just to explain again how the, the tokens work under the hood. So these are the, the primitive types, the basic building blocks. They've already been embedded into many of these other token types for you. So a webbug is just um, a URL, so I'm just going to say send it to bsizepuku at gmail.com. Now we're just going to say web test. So we hit create. We get a URL over here. Um, it says it gives you a description. This is going to trigger if it's request made, um, and then some you know interesting bit here. You could include it in an image tag, uh, which behaves like a, a, a tracking pixel. And then down here you'll get some ideas for usage. Um, embed it in a document, or drop it on a page that's only going to get found through a brute force group a brute force tool or a crawler or something. So not part of your regular application flow. Okay, so I'm just going to copy this off, request it in my browser, triggering the alert. And we'll refer to have a look at that alert in a second. And what I'm going to do now is just create that other sort of basic token as well. So let's go with uh, DNS token over here. Same email address again. There we go. Okay, and we say DNS test. Create token, this time it's a host name. Again, you get the description saying if we perform a DNS lookup, it's going to trigger an alert. And then some interesting use cases uh, drop it in your bash history, drop it in SSH config. And down here is a cool um, example of how you can sort of start building your own detection. So you can see here we're tailing an auth log, and then if there's a valid auth attempt, we're just going to run the, the host command over there. So I'll uh, just demonstrate that as well. 
just a simple DNS resolution will trigger the alert. Okay, so let's quickly have a look at those two alerts. Okay, so that's the HTTP alert with our reminder that we set over there. We get our source IP and we get the, the user agent included um, as part of that HTTP callback. Okay, the DNS alert, DNS test, and down here the source IP is the, the last DNS server that resolved that first thing. Okay, so let's go ahead and create some more exciting ones. Um, so I'm going to go with a Word document and then an AWS token. Word doc, edit, um, same email, and let's say Word doc on Tyron's gaming machine as, a, as an example. We hit create, download the token. Um, you can rename this thing you know, to something enticing, enticing, call it passwords, add some, some data in here. But essentially, MS Word opening up is going to cause that, um, that thing back via, via HTTP. Okay, so that's, that's a Word doc. We can see the alert trickling in over there. And um, let's have a look at the AWS key as well. There we go. Email address, uh, let's say AWS key on, I don't know, Home Assistant VM. Great. And this time around, you'll see it's just going to spit up to, you know, a valid AWS config that you can drop into your um, AWS credential file. So I've, uh, gone ahead and added a token into this AWS credential and we can run uh, just a, an S3 LS command. Okay, so that's just going to say use the Amazon CLI run S3 LS. Okay, just wait for the output. We see uh, access denied. That, that uh, canary token or the, the API key doesn't actually have access to, to perform much, but the uh, you already have the alert, the, you know, the attacker is just using that key to enumerate a potential AWS um, account. Okay, so that's that's the tokens that we wanted to cover here. We'll see the, um, the Word doc is coming using, again, the primitive HTTP channel, Word doc on my gaming machine, source IP, the user agent. And you'll notice that the, the AWS um, alert hasn't trickled in, and uh, that's kind of the, because of how the, the token works on the AWS backend, and we'll cover that um, in a couple of moments as well. Okay, so just reverting back to the slides to, to cover what we uh, went through. Um, so that, uh, sorry, that uh, web app is just a, a URL that if you visit, it's going to generate an alert, and there's, there's two variants of this token. So there's a fast and a slow redirect. It does exactly what it says. It's just going to redirect to a, a URL that you, you specify. The difference between the two, the slow redirect will run some JavaScript in your browser and grab some extra information um, so you can you know, redirect your company homepage or if you feel like trolling someone adding a recrawl redirect, then that's not kind of it. Okay, the DNS token, as you saw, just a host name, we resolve it, um, it uh, triggers an alert, and there's a nifty little extra feature um, which we'll cover as well that you can prepend some data in that um, DNS lookup and then you send some additional data with your, your DNS token. Um, DNS tokens is super flexible. If you think of um, anything that connects to a host name, provides a, an opportunity for you to shut in that token, and then if a connection is made, it's going to uh, trigger an alert. Um, also, DNS being DNS, you know, it's likely just going to get out the network. It's not uh, often the case where you know DNS is restricted, so um, you're going to get your alert using the, the DNS primitive um, channel. Okay, that word doc, you know, you can imagine drop it on your home endpoint, drop it in a corporate setting on that high value target um, using that. And again, it uses that basic HTTP callback mechanism. So maybe some of you are thinking, um, what happens if I open this um, word generating token without internet connectivity? Uh, it's not going to trigger it, right? Because you need, uh, you need that uh, internet basic thing. And then like, we kind of uh, hinted towards this uh, when we spoke about the efficacy of the token. Um, so I'm going to cover the AWS token, and then I'll revert back to the question and, and just provide you with the solution of how you can coerce stackers into definitely uh, getting an alert out of your, of your, your tokens. Okay, so that AWS key, valid set of credentials, um, really enticing, high fidelity alert. You're not expecting a, a regular user to install AWS CLI and perform API queries. Um, so, you know, I definitely recommend you the like button and use it. Um, not tied to your infrastructure at all, it just lives on our back end. Um, yeah, I mean, it's credentials that hackers need to use it, and it's enticing because you can potentially gain access to an entire um, AWS account. 
Okay, so I'm sure that AWS Alert has, has made its way into the mailbox by now. Um, we can have a look, but just to cover the sort of the, the nuts and bolts of this token, we're monitoring for, for cloud trail events on the back end. Once that's raised, we, we send an alert um, out to you. So if you've played around with AWS, you know that there's you know, tens, thousands of different types of services, and there are cases where um, some of those services or API calls don't log a cloud trail event. Um, so we made an announcement to the token where if uh, the credit, if the credential is used but there's no cloud trail event, we'll raise the safety net alert, which is an interesting piece of telemetry in its own. Could mean by chance someone made an API call that there's no cloud trail event for, or you're dealing with someone with some level of sophistication or a little bit of uh, in-depth AWS knowledge. Okay, so coming back to that efficacy, what happens if we use a Word document and there's no internet connectivity? Well, then you go for this sort of token stacking technique. And what you can see here is we've added some, you know, enticing information in that Word doc. This is how we get access to this AWS account. Please don't share these credentials and it's an token. Open it up without internet connectivity, it doesn't matter. The attacker's going to want to touch that Amazon API and, and you'll get your alert. And it's not the only token that you can show in there. Anything interfacing, cubic config, wire guard, they're going to want to touch it, you'll get your own Okay, um, so keeping that in mind, we wanted to see which different types of devices we could um, tokenize, and we, you know, keeping the back of our mind, working from home, please the end usage. We sort of asked ourselves, what devices do you have at home? Um, and then, you know, you'll have some typical computer device, laptop, computer, uh, a mobile device and uh, maybe some sort of route, you know, giving you, you internet access. So we wanted to see if we could tokenize different uh, device types, and this is what we came up with. Okay, uh, so first I'll just show you the, the wire guard. Uh, so you can easily imagine you're dropping an AWS key or a, or a, a Word document onto sort of a, a laptop or a for a desktop, um, and then the, the WireGuard token plays pretty nicely into that mobile space. So we can just say WireGuard on uh, Tyron's iPhone, hit create, and what this does is it splits out a QR code or a WireGuard VPN config that you can just add to your phone. So I've uh, preemptively added a, you know, one of these to my phone, and I'll just connect to the VPN, and that's going to trigger an alert as well. So we'll We'll have a look at that alert in a bit. So that's kind of got desktop, laptop, mobile covered. I can see that alert popped in, um, but we wanted to check out whether we could add some detection to your sort of little um, small office home office router. Um, so Denver came out with a detection for a Mikrotik. Um, you can see here it's hosted in AWS. It's just for the sake of the demo. Typically, this is on your home network. No one's touching this other than you. And um, we're going to try and. Uh, Log in over here. Uh, I think Google will probably moan at me. I know they didn't. Anyhow, oh, there we go. Nice. Um, so let's have a look at those two alerts over there. So, um, which one is this? Okay, so there's the wire guard on my phone. So I try to connect to a VPN, trigger an alert, and then uh, see another one popping up over here. So here we go. B size Mikrotik, source IP. And this time it's a DNS based um, alert, but you can see some extra data, and we'll, we'll cover that. But yeah, it's saying, um, someone connected to the Mikrotik over the web channel, the author's admin, and that's the, the IP inside the, the Mikrotik's uh, log over there. Yeah, so that's um, how we did that. Uh, we can move back to the slides again. So that WireGuard token is uh, super flexible. There's a WireGuard client for almost all of the major operating systems, iOS, Android, Mac, Windows, whatever, so you can drop it pretty much anywhere. Um, I know if I compromise an endpoint and it says poor VPN, I'm going to want to check out what's behind that VPN. Um, I kind of have two ways of thinking about the token as well. So you can, like we did with a phone or you know other device, configure the actual VPN tunnel, and then when that connection is made, it triggers. Or you can just sprinkle the files around. So maybe you have a really restricted network, three jump boxes deep, drop a wire or config on each jump box. That way, if the attacker exfiltrates that config, tries to connect to that VPN, you know they're on jump box one, two, or three. So, really cool token, recommend using it as well. Um, and then for the Mikrotik, I'm sure some light bulbs went up already in the audience. How do we do this? Uh, 
uh, if you're familiar with Mikrotix, they have a little scripting engine, so we're just monitoring there for failed login attempts and then triggering that, um, again, that primitive DNS lookup. Okay, so interesting bit there was that generic data, and yeah, you can see it says, you know, the channel's one box, um, the user was admin, and uh, the attacker that the, the IP that the attacker came from was, uh, yeah, the IP you can see over there, and they will share some of his fun that he had getting the generic um, data included in the, the lib content. Cool. So, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, we managed to get a Microtech reporting of the DNS channel um, uh, using one of the DNS component tokens and managed to, uh, after some difficulties, actually encode the generic dots into that as well. So, as mentioned before, that's base32 encoded um, and it just forms like a prefix to the host name that gets generated with the token um, following some specific rules it's documented on canarytokens.org. Um, in the past, uh, Mikrotech gave us a full Lua scripting environment, and it uh, probably would have been pretty easy to implement using that. They then promptly removed it. Um, I assume people were having too much fun with it. So they moved to a pretty um, stripped down kind of scripting environment where things like functions are kind of an exotic ask. So we had to put some effort into using like simple things like just maps and lookup tables just to do uh, kind of getting. Uh, values for ASCII characters and then it has a lookup table for the base 32 encoding but uh, yeah we, we got it right. The way it works is it uh, actually just trails um, the authentication log in the Mikrotech you can see stale attempts, pauses it out with some primitive uh, string pausing and matching uh, and then generates the base 32 prefix and uses a DNS token for that. So what we thought the nice thing about this was it gives you the channel, you know, wooden box in this case but uh, you think usually it probably just be like SSH or something. Mikrotix specifically allow a number of different channels. You can access them over the web, API, HTTPS, and some of if you really want, you can allow FTP login. So it's uh, good to get that little bit of extra info. You might, uh, it might help in terms of figuring out what port it was left open in the firewall. You know, like when box H1 was FTP, that's pretty strange. If someone's accessing the API of your own router, that's really, really worrying. Um, and then obviously it's nice to have the, the username and uh, source ID as well. Cool. So that, uh, that was the fun that we had over there. Um, now, we also thought, cool, we chose a pretty feature-rich router. You know, not everyone's running Mikrotex at home. And not everything has a built-in scripting environment. So we wanted to demonstrate that these tokens are super useful on any router, really. Um, the prime example is anything with a wire or client. You know, we're working remotely these days. People are set up maybe a wire or base VPN. Fires aren't pretty popular for managing that. Um, so we can actually repurpose the wire token um, and that'll just work on any router that supports wire client. clients. Um, as Tara showed us, we can easily just generate a new one, copy the config, paste it into uh, the router, or just download the config and upload it, call it something cool like corporate VPN or intranet or uh, management admin network. That's pretty enticing for an attacker to try and break into our admin network. They'll definitely want to connect to that and uh, start rummaging around and by that time they'll have triggered an alert for us. Um, so, all the breaches, you know, for, for people like myself, why well, God's a fairly new thing. Um, if you, you don't have support for that, you can also just repurpose the DNS token um, for, you know, just about any VPN function into any router. So, in this case, um, we showed that, let's say, for a GLI net router or pretty much any generic brand, and it supports open VPN tunnels, same deal will work with PPTP, LTTP, just about anything that does like a host name lookup. Just set the remote host to a canary token domain, make sure you annotate it, add in a, a token note, um, to say, cool, like my own router um, token. And as soon as someone tries to connect to that tunnel or that uh, VPN, which will no doubt be called like super important corporate VPN, we'll get an alert once again. So it kind of just demonstrates again how flexible these things are, you really can just sprinkle them around everywhere. Um, and then come up with new use cases for them. Uh, this just shows us the alerts, you know, the first one was a wire got specific, the token line is definitely something you want to set, as I uh, mentioned, and um, the token is definitely the wire guard, but uh, the next one is pretty generic, so we used uh, the DNS token on that, Use an open VPN client, um, but uh, yeah, as we said, we'll put just about everything, you can TV, LTTV, and the source ID if it's not something you recognize, that uh, also might be worth investigating. Cool. So the next thing is, uh, I think a, a lot of us 
end up working a lot with CRC D systems, and maybe actually working remotely, still on uh, <laughs> pushing code to uh, GitHub or GitLab or something. Um, and a lot of that is making these pretty extensively of Docker containers. So I'm going to start uh, demonstrating how we can um, use that. I'll start with just a um, Dockerized container and then move into uh, how we can apply that to a CRCD system. So first we'll just have a look at um, what our Docker file looks like. And this is just a demonstration of a basic tokenized Docker container. You can pull something from like a standard repository. We just install some packages if you need. And um, the important parts are just copying this bash RC. We went with bash RC so that um, we would end up triggering this if someone just executes the container, um, like they do a Docker run, or they do a Docker run with an argument, or they do a Docker exec into a running container. You can see we've also set the entry point to that, and um, we'll see how that works in a bit. Cool, so let's just see um, what. Uh, what the file looks like. Cool. So inside that, we've just got uh, two functions, super simple bash part, not your usual bash RC, but, uh, but uh, I think that forms part of the deception of the whole thing. We've just got a chirp function, and that uh, has a token variable set to the, the DNS host name, or connect token, and uh, that just simply just does a host on it, so it basically does a DNS lookup on that. Uh, next, we have a, a watch, which is basically what uh, this is called as soon as the script runs. It uh, uses unnotified wait, likes binary to watch for file system events, um, and uh, they quietly want to access to anything part out of a path environment variable. So, as soon as you try and run something that sits in the path like LS or Luma or ID, um, you'll probably trigger, or you will trigger, um, an alert. So, we'll see how this fits in with the CRC thing later. Cool. Um, so we can hold our container and call it something for interesting like secrets management. Um, that's, uh, I mean, in the tackle the container called secrets management, they'd be pretty enticed to have a look at what's going on inside there. And then, um, you know, we might want to run a command like who am I in the container. Um, it'll execute as usual, but um, it will also trigger an alert, and you can see it's already showing up on the side there. Uh, so this is just the same as we've seen before, but uh, coming from this container. Cool. So that's the kind of basics. Now we can uh, dive into how this uh, applies to our CR or CD environment. Um, Dev put together this project uh, for us just as an example um, to show us uh, you know, how we can uh, go about using this in a, a more realistic or real-life scenario. I called it code signer. The, the reasoning was to kind of make it look like there might be some uh, uh, private keys or certificates embedded somewhere in this repository. Um, and uh, the, the kind of thought process is if someone gets access to this repo, whether it was made public by accident or an attacker managed to compromise uh, your GitLab server and get an account, you know, they, uh, they'd likely start poking around and this, this looks like a pretty enticing project. Or maybe the project was made public due to some uh, inauthentic behavior, possibly uh, coordinated by the blue team. Um, yeah. So just to maybe I should just go back. If I have a look at this repo, there's nothing going on yet. There's a readme file, so pretty standard GitLab template. But uh, you know, a little bit newer there's a GitLab CI. It seems to be the only kind of active part. So to me, this uh, from a tech perspective is definitely what I'd be interested in. So the only file is actually doing anything. Um, uh, just if you're familiar with GitLab CI, well, I'll go through this. We're pulling in a pretty standard. Uh, Container, but uh, with a kind of enticing name called Vault Helper. So, Vault uh, is usually used in, a, in the sense of credential management or secret management. Um, but as an attacker, I'd be pretty excited if I came across something like um, this being called like Vault Helper, and this thing looks like it's pulling out uh, using the Vault binary to sign code. So, it's just if I would enter a bold and deploy stage with uh, three pipelines defined. Um, the first one just, you know, is, is made to appear like it's signing some code, outputs it, um, creates an artifact. So, um, what, what would be going on inside that container? It could be like some embedded certificates or keys that are used to sign code. It can then upload to the rest of our infrastructure and run or deploy. Next, um, we've got this copy to S3. We'll go through that. 
um, you know, in more depth, but it's like, cool, we're getting AWS credentials, that looks interesting, creds, vault get, we're like using vault again, we definitely, uh, there's definitely something going on in that vault Docker container, definitely want to poke around that, um, at least from an attacker's perspective, then uh, we're very naively um, echo that as the console, uh, or the output log, and trying to load it, so it, it looks like we might be getting access to an S3 bucket or something like that, definitely want to see what's happening with those credentials, and lastly, like this is almost keys to the kingdom, we see a cube config. Um, so pulling in a generic image name, just the latest version of it, like this isn't anything company specific, it's just a little cube CTL doc container. So there definitely won't be anything interesting in there. It's public, um, but it looks like later on we've got this uh, um, CR variable defined that um, we must contain. Um, Clients and server keys to allow us to talk to a Kubernetes then. So, as an attacker, if I can get access to a Kubernetes cluster, that, uh, that's looking pretty exciting. I'm definitely going to try and run kubectl, get some trust info for that. Um, but let's take a look at these pipelines and see what, uh, well, what, what the output looks like. I mean, we definitely, from a tax perspective, want to see what, uh, what the log output looks like, see if there's anything interesting there. Um, Cool. So this looks like I just signed something, some code, create some artifacts. So we've, um, in lieu of actually poking around the container, I'll just rerun this pipeline and we'll start seeing some alerts coming in as this uh, goes through. Uh, so this is a similar container that we went through previously. Um, as soon as you do anything inside, it will trigger an alert. So if we go back to the jobs, we can maybe just have a look at this copy to S3 thing, you know, put code signing thing. Nothing too interesting happening there. I can go back to that for our farm tech guy here. Cool, AWS credentials seems to be getting something from Vault. Interesting, exporting them. Um, and now they're going into the console. So, from again, an attacker perspective, we definitely want to see what's going on here. We're going to use these credentials, try and uh, see what we've got access to. Does it give us access to an account or multiple accounts? Um, you know, how much infrastructure can we actually get out of this? Um, so, as soon as you try and use them for anything, as I mentioned, or demonstrate with AWS client or CLI, uh, an alert will immediately trigger. So, again, you can see that um, they token credentials, they don't actually have access to anything, um, even though they're legit, but um, as soon as they use that, will trigger an alert. So, if I were to rerun this pipeline, for example, you'll probably see one of these uh, alerts coming through. And then lastly, just to show kind of an interesting use of the, the, one of the newer tokens, which is the um, Kubernetes token. It's, uh, it's actually a, a full cube uh, config file. So you can just pass it straight into kubectl, use it, see what happens. Um, in this, it, uh, it's made to look like we were having kube config from the environment using kubectl and trying to uh, just get a cluster info from it. Um, the token itself just import the backend implements just enough to uh, complete the negotiation to the point where we can give an unauthorized response, which is all we need because by that time we've already got an alert, the token's done its job, we know someone is using this config that really should not be. Um, if we really run that, we'll probably, um, probably see uh, when that will be coming in shortly as well. So we can also just have a look at the CICD variables just to see what that token looks like. Um, as expected though, just from the pipeline, it's uh, just a base 64 encoded vision um, of a cube config. Um, point being like, we can protect the variables or mask them or whatever, but if an attacker gets like maintainer access to the repository, you're still gonna be able to read the, the raw text and just kind of base 64 decode it. Um, yeah, so I think that's pretty much um, a reasonable overview of kind of a real world scenario and how to use these things and um, make a repository that looks enticing to attackers um, and just kind of, you know, at home alone, booby trap everything, put tripwires all over the place and hope someone does trip over them and they're very likely well. Um, cool. So we just went through the three jobs that we had created. The first one, just to recap, we did a little bash script inside the container. As soon as anything happens, whether something's executed on the path, or someone runs the container, or even if it's a, you know, maybe someone gets access to like your GitLab runner, um, and they see this uh, secrets management container is just running in the background, maybe they want to exec into it and do like an ID or rumor, but still get an alert, so it's uh, definitely what, uh, I think 
that I will do in terms of uh, trying to do some recon. Just um, once again, reiterate how flexible these tokens actually are. I mean, we can use um, many different types. In this case, we just use DNS. We still manage to um, uh, embed a little bit of information in that alert, and also obviously the token you know, it tells us where this came from. And the second job kind of speaks to the supply chain security. You know, if someone manages to get our AWS credentials, they can pretty much take over the entire account. So we um, made it look like uh, a simple error in terms of debugging. We accidentally like we go to our AWS credentials to the console. An attacker would definitely want to try to use them um, if they were super like. Uh, concerned or trying to be um, very stealthy, they might, if if such an API still exists, uh, find one that uh, doesn't log to CloudTrail, which is how we um, look for use of AWS tokens. Um, even in that case, we would still get an alert, as Tara mentioned, as an AWS safety net um, that, that would uh, alert us on any API access, even if not logged to CloudTrail. So this uh, just shows a little bit of a deception in engineering in terms of purposely echoing AWS credentials into uh, our GitLab CI output. Um, cool. And then the last one is, the, as I mentioned, the fake new token. Kubernetes is being pretty popular. We created a, a kubeconfig token. So that generates a specific configuration for you. You can sprinkle it around. Um, in this case, we use it in our pipeline to make it look like um, a cluster that we wanted to deploy to, uh, in line with kind of creating uh, artifacts, um, copying to S3 and then trying to deploy some sound code. Um, it does differ to other tokens in that it actually relies on mutual TLS authentication, so client and server will authenticate each other. Um, so yeah, that, that kind of makes it unique in that the back end um, has to implement enough of this to actually complete that negotiation to the point where the Kube CTL client believes that it is talking to a legit uh, Kubernetes cluster. Then obviously we just give a, an authorized, but by the time we've already omitted. Um, just one thing that, uh, that it was an interesting exercise in bringing this all together. Like we, it's small, but it's like the 10,000 character limit try to embed. Uh, trying to embed the queue config in a GitLab CI variable. So the, the exercise is, you know, how do we work around that? Um, we just had a look at the config, saw, oh, okay, they typically embed the CA certificate um, too, but we could remove that, save a couple of lines, and uh, just set like the insecure TLS no verify flag. Um, so that showed up for about 3,000 characters, and then we managed to uh, shove that into a CI variable. The, the takeaway being, this was like a simple stumbling block, but a little bit of creativity goes a long way. You know, it's super easy to work around these things, and it once again speaks to like the flexibility of these tokens. Um, you can use them in new, interesting ways, and sort of um, the solid them into working for you uh, in various scenarios. So again, just going through the cube config token, we just thought as an environment variable, and as mentioned before, as soon as we get that unauthorized response back, it's already too late. Uh, we know there's an attack using this config, and um, yeah, the, the token has done its job. So yeah, uh, just moving on from that, uh, there is a pretty uh, widely distributed like CRCD threat matrix, um, and uh, it kind of gives a, a number of scenarios where an attacker may exploit your CRCD system, and how you may compromise them. The, the point of this is not to go through everything, but just sort of like, you know, choose a couple and say, can we use a canary tokens in some interesting way to um, avoid these situations or at least alert us on this? So, as you know, supply chain compromise of our CLCD, I think we've, we covered that pretty extensively. Like, if someone were to run that job, we would definitely know about it. Um, it's uh, just a little bit. While there's injecting source code, you know, an attacker might think they need to use the vault credential or use a vault Docker container to try and sign something. We definitely can, uh, can alert on that. Injecting code, it's, it's pretty similar. Modifying CRCD configuration, um, get that or get a blast for uh, doing webhooks on any modification to a repo so we can uh, just connect those to like a, a canary token webhook. Um, and we'd get an alert on that as well. Maybe that's just kind of creative use of uh, existing primitives. But yeah, I think that pass through would be to be changed a bit. Um, but yeah, ultimately, I think the the takeaway is that a lot of these situations can be at least uh, 
which get all made um, very obvious that something's happening by our creative use of canary uh, tricks. So that's, uh, that's all I've done the CRCD stuff, um, apart from our uh, difficulties with Mercutech, but I'm actually open to working the way that I wanted to. And yeah, I think we're open to questions now. And uh, yeah, Merry Christmas. And that, uh, that is a line from Home the Lion. It's not, uh, yeah, the fear of missing all the Oh, one Thanks for the talk, it's pretty cool. Um, I'm curious, so the, the efficacy of these tokens obviously depends on your backend being up, um, but since the tokens are free, how sustainable is the business and how do you make money? Spinnerytokens.org chat, I don't think it's good chat. Um, no, um, the backend's up all the time. Um, if you don't trust it, you can go over to your own canarytokens.org um, server on the, you just go to GitHub page, you host the you can kind of follow the steps, create your own, and then um, the business has its, the commercial offering has its own. You get your sort of single tenant at own console, and that has its own um, canary token server. Yeah. Quick. Just to like, confirm that thanks, Canary, has been around for a pretty long time. It's, it's well known, and that, uh, that is kind of giving something back uh, alongside the commercial product, which is exceptionally popular in our weekly. That, uh, it's available on several continents, so it's it's not going away anytime soon, and it's a uh, it's a service we want to keep up because it uh, you know it helps people or helps make people aware of us and has time. So there's an open source version of it. So if you don't trust us, host your own and use it that way. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Um, I'm wondering what sort of like a um, you know having a counter attack on these. So what would happen if you know, attackers start getting more savvy and recognizing the canary tokens, either, you know, so that they can automatically avoid them, um, if that becomes commonplace, and you know, is there any way to protect against that? And then also, is there any mitigation if they start recognizing it and, you know, they might, for example, start just flooding notifications in to kind of like, you know, disguise the triggers, like once they realize the trigger has been popped, they'll just like flood you with all the triggers they can find, so it's hard for you to actually see which triggers are meaningful uh, yeah so there's there's definitely you know a way to uncover that it's a canary token if you google lot enough you'll find scripts and things that can um, do that for you so if you host your own canary token um, server you can change the, your own domain and um, that way it's not hosted on canary tokens and um, then it's just a regular dns traffic and uh, it's going to be pretty hard to distinguish that that's just a, it's just a dns lookup so um this kind of ways to defend against that. And again, you, you come up with clever strategies like stacking tokens, like the AWS token inside the Word document. That Word document doesn't have to be a canary token. It can be a regular vanilla Word document. How are you going to know that that's a canary token? So there's ways around that. And then, sorry, your, your second question was? Uh, the alert fatigue, like spamming you with, with tokens. Uh, sure, um, I guess someone can spam you with alerts. Um, but on that initial interaction, that's all you need, right? I placed this token on box one. Whether you send me one or a thousand alerts, I don't care. Like, you've touched the thing that I've pushed over there, but let's go check it out. Okay, then maybe just a quick follow-up question on that is, um, is there any integration um, with Canary tokens to, you know, existing sort of like, you know, tripwire style tools? Uh, yeah, so the... Intrusion detection systems? Like I said, I'm the, I'm the sales guy, so it's hard for me not to pivot to the commercial stuff. Um, but the, with the free tokens, there's a webhook and email, so you can go do something with a webhook, I assume. Um, and then with the commercial offering, it, there's a bunch of different integration options, getting that into your regular SIMS or log collector ticketing system, whichever works over there. I'm of interest, have you seen the potential for malicious parties actually using canary tokens as well. So, for instance, what you see with malware, malware groups actually forming proper companies, Jira, 95s, that kind of thing, eventually you're probably going to end up with their infra. Not that I'm saying that you're, it, it's like any tool, right? As When you become good, you, you find some fail, right? So, any, any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, it's pretty easy. Like I can give you a hammer, you can bolt the door, break the door. You know, that's that's going to be the case. Um, I did pen testing prior to this, 
and I use tokens to clean the first time around, upload and get a ping back, oh shit, like, this thing's speaking out to the internet, let's try and hack it. So yeah, that's there, like, use it however you want to use it, use it for the right purpose, but can't prevent someone from taking the hammer and smashing the door down. So that's my idea. Thank you. Yeah. Hi there. Thanks for the talk. It was very cool. I had a question there in one of your slides said something about kidnapping in case. Um, are they like, uh, yeah, your success story is outside of like infosec. Do you have any good ones? Um, I didn't have them out of the top of my head, but uh, I probably didn't put it on the slide uh, just fictitiously. So we do get some callbacks from, from law enforcement every now and again saying, saying thanks. Um, one that I recently spoke to someone about was they were teaching someone about secure document practices and they're using canary tokens as that try and open the, the document without triggering any type of thing so it's not primarily used to reduce dwell time in your home in your network uh, but there's weird and wonderful ways to, to use them and we get those sort of thing back i don't have the the insight to, to share it was this you know in law enforcement agency that said this on the same time but i i can assure you we're not lying Thanks.